Alejandro, welcome to CBSBaltimore.com. Thanks welcome for having me. Welcome Thanks to so online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excited we, to be here. We uh, just did a uh, we taped a coffee with, which uh, you can find on a different page here at CBSBaltimore.com. But we wanted to continue discussing the boys of Dunbar, a story of potentially one of the greatest high school basketball teams ever, <laughs> a story of a bunch of guys from an impoverished area of Baltimore a story of a coach who believed in his community in Baltimore and the potential of it. It's a great tale. It is really a great tale. What do you want people to take away from this book? Um, I want people to understand, even if they're not fans of basketball, that it's much bigger than a basketball story. So we touch on the individual lives of, of the star players, the head coach, we go into the home and we get to know who these guys are. Um, you know, we get to get a sense and a feel and a smell for what was going on in East Baltimore in the early 1980s. So you had a bunch of different factors that kind of coalesced and came together uh, because things don't happen in a vacuum, right? So in the early 80s, you have the plague of crack cocaine, which is really beginning uh, to ravage the community on top of you know, the, the heroin that's already ravaging the community. Uh, you also have the loss of the blue collar wage. Um, earlier generations were able to come up uh, during the Great Migration and find great employment opportunities in the steel mills, the factories mm -hmm. were running three shifts a day. So when the agrarian economy down south kind of came to a halt, people went in search of the promised land. And Baltimore was one of those cities where people left the tobacco fields of North Carolina and the cotton fields down south and came here and were able to purchase their own homes and scrub their marble steps and build towards a better future. And when this team comes along, unfortunately, you know, all of that is being fractured. So you have the drugs, you have the loss of the blue collar wage, and you have a community that is really, really struggling. And within that construct, you have this remarkable team that is the cheapest entertainment ticket in Baltimore, where people are able to go into that gym and just be mesmerized and for a few hours feel great about themselves and arm to, to come out and you know face another day. I will never forget there was a legendary sports catcher in this town named Charlie Ekman. Charlie by the way was an NBA coach. He was coach of the Pistons when they were in Fort Wayne and took them basically all the way then became a great college referee. Remember when Dean Smith went into the four corners and a referee pulled the chair out and sat down and said if you're going to play that I can ref it from here? <laughs> that was Charlie Ekman. Beckman once told me, this was off here, he once told me that if the real basketball fan of Baltimore had the courage to go down to that neighborhood and, and go to that gym and watch Dunbar Poets, they'd see the best basketball ever. Mm. And this comes from a guy who did the NBA and college. Right. Think that one. You know what? I'm looking. But we can, can we bring up the, the uh, picture of the cover the picture again? picture of the cover. Hold it up there for a second, Gary. Lynn, take a look. Mm -hmm. These days, if you go into... Uh, a high school. Chances are the coach has some kind of a deal with Adidas or Nike Under Armour. For the uniforms? Well, if I'm looking at the shoes. <laughs> These guys had to go get those shoes. Or Wade had to make some kind of a, a deal with some merchant to, to get sure them. To make sure they can have them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a totally different it's time totally and different space. Deal. And, and you look at today, right, and, and this is another fascinating thing about this team. Today's basketball is dominated by this AAU culture, these mm -hmm. sneaker companies. Um, during the summer, guys are fractured off playing on competing teams oh, yeah. for prime recruiting positions. You know, this was at a time where the head coach, the head basketball coach at the high school was really the most important point of contact in terms of college recruitment. The guys stayed together during the summer and they would take long road trips to go to summer camps together. Um, they played in neighborhood tournaments like the Baltimore Neighborhood Basketball mm -hmm. League and Project Survival. And it really was a cohesive group. And, you know, it's something that people say, and it's a cliche, they played for the name of the front of the jersey, not the name on the back. But it really was true. They didn't care who scored the most points, who scored the most rebounds. The only thing they cared about was actually winning. And the way that they won was majestic. For somebody who's just having to be logging on, and wondering what's this all about. Tell them the pros that came off of that team. You from had, the starting five. 
Right. Well, let's start with the bench okay, because good. there was right. a player who did not start for the team who actually some people think became the best professional out of all of them, and that was Reggie Lewis. Reggie Lewis played at Northeastern University for uh, Jim Calhoun, uh, got drafted by the Boston Celtics, and eventually supplanted the great Larry Bird as the captain of the Boston Celtics. Unfortunately, he passed away due to a heart defect when he was 28 years old. So Reggie Lewis comes off the bench as the sixth man. So just think about that mm -hmm. for a second. How it's good incredible. is their team think about that, 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 that yep, the incredible. future captain of the Boston Celtics didn't start? Mm -hmm. You had Tyrone Muggsy Bogues, who is the most revolutionary basketball talent the basketball world has ever seen. We'll see 10 more Michael Jordans before we see one more Muggsy Bogues. Shortest True player that. ever True in that. the history of the NBA, could dominate a game without scoring a point, was a defensive genius, was a one-man fast break, uh, was just a superb talent. And, you know, people need to kind of go back to YouTube and understand, if they watch basketball today, really understand how dynamic he was. You had David Wingate, who won a national championship with Georgetown University, playing for John Thompson. Uh, Wingate played 15 years in the NBA. And then you had Reggie Williams, who was the consensus number one high school player in the country. People say, well, how good was Reggie? As a freshman at Georgetown University, he was the most outstanding player in the Final Four and helped John Thompson win Georgetown University's first national championship. So the collection of, of talent is mind-boggling that was on this team. And as you mentioned on air, you could start listing guys on that team who played major Division I college ball. Yep. Big league college ball. Yeah, you had Gary Graham who went to UNLV. He was the captain of UNLV's Final Four team. You had Tim Dawson who was the Atlantic 10 Rookie of the Year at George Washington University who later transferred to play at the University of Miami. And you can go on and on down the bench and there was major Division I talent of guys that didn't play much at all. And your book delves really into their personal lives, which you say are very powerful stories. Right. Yeah, very powerful. I mean, when you look at Bob Wade's individual story, um, you know, his father left the home when he was just a child. Mom had to struggle to kind of keep the household afloat. So he was a product of a single parent home. And, you know, he kind of, in essence, was a father figure at least to a lot of these guys who didn't have fathers in their home and so when you look at kind of the struggle of what the individual players went through um, you know their parents and their uncles and their cousins and some of the other things that were going on in the community to me that's the most powerful element of this story is again you know it's a story of love it's a story of hope it's a story of a struggling community that came together that uh, you know were motivated by this dynamic mm -hmm. group of young kids who did things on a basketball court that hasn't been done before or since. You know, and, and look, I'm looking at your, 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 your short resume here. I mean, you, um, I mean, you were, you've written for the Times, AP, Bleach Report, Sporting News, Sun, LA Times, and you looked at this and said that with your, with, with your body of work, things you have seen, interest you have you said this is the story that's what you wanted to focus on yeah which, which says a ton mm -hmm. man i mean that's just truly unbelievable it really honestly is from some of the folks involved what are they saying to you um i, I think people are really excited you know because this was a story and i'm really surprised that it sat around for so long and no one kind of told it, hmm. you know? So I think people are excited to revisit this great era of basketball, and I think people are really excited to find out about this great team. I don't disagree with you. And if you happen to be maybe new to the area or don't know a lot about Dunbar, go online and look it up. Matter of fact, start with who the school is named after. Start right there and move it forward, move it forward, move it forward. It's, I'm so thrilled that you did this book. Because in a way, in a way, not unlike Barry Levinson's Diner Guys, which took place in Northwest Baltimore, which defined a real segment of Baltimore. This is the same thing. It's that cohesiveness. It's that bond. It's that friendship for life in its own unique circumstance that makes this a great story. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's Diner for a New Generation. 
Well, I really appreciate that. And, and the, another fantastic thing about this team was, you know, today people see Baltimore as this hotbed mm -hmm. of basketball talent, right? We have Carmelo Anthony, the great Carmelo yeah. Anthony, mm -hmm. who holds the flame aloft and at the highest level. You have a guy like Will Barton who uh, plays in the NBA, Sam Cassell and all these other guys. In the early 1980s, Baltimore was not seen as a hotbed of talent. A lot of scouts bypassed Baltimore and said Philly, D.C., New York, that's where all the talent is mm -hmm. until these guys came. And obviously there were great players in the past that we talk about here in the book, like the great Skip Wise, right, the great Ernie Grahams. Uh, but it wasn't until this team came along where people started to say, what is going on Pay attention. in this small city of Baltimore where this phenomenal conglomeration of talent has come together and uh, they really changed the whole dynamic of how the city was seen in the larger basketball community. Wow. Wow. I love smelling books. It's brand new. <laughs> it's brand new. Mm -hmm. You can't get, with all due respect <laughs> to those to download, you can't. And it's not the same. No, you can't feel the cover either. It's, 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 it's listen, congratulations. congratulations. Thank you so much. On a work that I think is an important one for Baltimore, Maryland. I mean, it really honestly is. You did a heck of a job. Ten man. years in the making. Yep. A story labor of, of love. Labor love, of love. Hope mm -hmm. and basketball. Think this out, Lynn. I'm going to stand up for a second. <laughs> okay? I stand to statue S 5'6". Five, 5 foot 3 inches tall. 3 inches shorter. One of the greatest basketball players in his era in the NBA. Shorter than Is me. Because I'm 5'4". Shorter than you. <laughs> so, hey, it, listen, it, there's so many great stories. Hey, listen, we got to run. Thank you so much for your I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for stopping by CBSBaltimore.com.